Hello, John. Hello. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. Oh, my pleasure. Could you explain what it means to be a tour designer for a space mission? Well, a tour designer, and particularly for the mission I work on, which is a spacecraft that is actually in orbit about planet Saturn, um, a tour designer is pretty much like someone who um, takes a group of really enthusiastic scientists to Disneyland. And, of course, just like anyone else, the scientists want to you know, go on every ride, and they all want to do different things. But the constraint is, is that we all have to move together as a group because on the spacecraft, all the instruments are all attached to the same spacecraft. And so the tour designer is really the tour guide. Um, I, along with a coworker, Brent Buffington, we decide where the spacecraft is going to go and when. We design the path the spacecraft is going to follow during its time in the Saturn system. So we're trying to make everyone you know, pretty happy, but we pretty much only have, say, one day at Disneyland, and we all have to move together, and our job is to figure out what path we're going to take. Could you explain how the process of the first round of a tour design takes place? Would you consider it to be a creative process? Oh, it's it's absolutely creative. It's also incredibly iterative and just partly blind luck. Uh, the way we design a tour is we look at all the science requirements and all the other constraints that are placed on us from the engineering side. We pretty much throw as many different designs against the wall as we can and then basically see which ones stick. And sticking is determined by both the scientists and also by the engineering teams, the people that are actually going to have to fly this mission and operate the spacecraft day to day. So, you know, we, we try to come up with an idea that, you know, might work, throw it out there, see what feedback we get. And we throw a lot of different ideas out there, most of which get rejected, but of course some continue on. How many different scientists are actually involved in the project and how are their objectives prioritized when planning the different missions? Well, that's, that's a huge issue. We have over 200 scientists uh, all around the world at Cassini. We have 18 member countries participating making Cassini a really fabulous uh, example of international collaboration. And those 200 scientists are pretty much broken up into five groups. Uh, one is for Saturn, one is for the its biggest moon, Titan, which is pretty much like a planet in itself. Another one is for all the other small moons of Saturn. One is just for the rings of the Saturn, and one is for the kind of esoteric-sounding magnetospheric and plasma. And those groups tend to filter up their desires through five representatives, and we deal a lot with those representatives in terms of trying to determine what is really important and what's not. But the bottom line is we throw stuff out there and we get feedback from everybody. And that's when we really learn what's important and what is kind of a nice to have, but not a fall on your sword type of objective. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the science that has come back from this mission, and has any of it been unexpected or particularly interesting to you? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think the two biggest uh, kind of two big ones are the moon Titan and the moon Enceladus. And if you know, you can't neglect the rings of Saturn or Saturn itself because there's been a lot of amazing discoveries with those. But if we focus just on Titan, for example, it's a moon with a thicker atmosphere than Earth itself, and the atmosphere has been opaque until the arrival of Cassini because it's so darn thick. And what Cassini has found is that the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, and it's just filled with organic molecules, that is, carbon-based molecules, which are the building blocks of life. And we see on the surface of Titan standing bodies of liquid methane, liquid ethane, the only other place in the solar system you find standing liquid, and a complete almost hydrological-like cycle, except instead of using water at Titan, it's methane and ethane. And so it's a very, the big punchline is that Titan may just be the biggest Earth analog in the entire solar system, more so than even Mars, which is something no one really expected going in. And then the other big punchline, you know, big uh, discovery is the moon Enceladus. It's a tiny little ice ball moon that by all accounts should just be a dead ice ball, but instead it's geologically active and there are geysers or jets of ice particles 
spraying out of the South Pole. It almost looks like a huge motor has been attached to this moon. And the big debate right now is whether there's a liquid water ocean beneath the surface of Enceladus. And most of the scientists believe that there is some large body of liquid water. And if that's true, we have all the basic ingredients for life as we know it. Liquid water, an energy source, and we know also that there's organic molecules coming out of the plumes of Enceladus. So that's been a huge you know, surprise, and it's moved Enceladus way up to near the top of the list as places to look for life in our solar system. So fascinating. I love it. What is Cassini currently collecting data on right now? Well, right now we are kind of orbiting in the same plane that all the moons and ring particles are orbiting in. So we're having a lot of close flybys of what we call the icy moons of Saturn. Uh, for example, we just had a Mimas flyby on February 13th and a Rhea flyby on March 2nd. And next Monday, we're going to have a close Titan flyby. And next Monday, we'll have a close Dione flyby. And the flybys of the moons are always really fun because the surfaces, sometimes you're seeing stuff for the very first time. But of course, you know, we're pursuing kind of a balanced science strategy where we're going to get information on Saturn, the rings, the magnetosphere. You know, our, our mantra is balanced science. We're not really focusing just on the moons or just on any one particular thing. We're kind of doing the whole, you know, enchilada. I actually just saw a photo of Mimas where it looked like Pac-Man. I think there was a thermal image. And the way yeah. it came across, it looked like Pac-Man. It was such a great photograph. I loved it. Yeah, it also looks like the Death Star. Yeah. If you compare it to the Death Star, this huge crater. I mean, I've got an image of one of my slides. That it's just hilarious. It's awesome. Uh, what objectives will be focused on for the remainder of the Cassini tour? Well, we got into orbit in 2004. And right now, we are about in our sixth year around orbit about Saturn, and we just designed a mission that will take us all the way to nearly the end of 2017, at which time we planned a suicide plunge into Saturn. So we're going to continue um, balanced science, but a big focus on Titan flybys, a big focus on Enceladus flybys. We're going to be flying through the plume or the jets. We're going to actually pass right through them and collect data about a half dozen times, as well as fly by the other moons. And of course, we're going to study the rings, Saturn itself, you know, the magnetosphere and plasma, you know, all these things that I really haven't had a chance to even talk about are just fascinating. And they're literally, we've got books now that have already been written just on data from the Cassini mission. So there's a lot of good stuff coming, and it'll keep coming on a fairly regular basis all the way through, we hope, <laughs> for 2017. Excellent. What first inspired you to get involved in space exploration? Well, I have to say it's the Apollo Space Program. Uh, my mom still has a birthday card that I made for my dad when I was two years old that shows a rocket going off and contrails coming out of the back. And then I'd say probably I grew up on Star Trek as a kid. And when I was in fifth or sixth grade, I had Voyager and Viking pictures plastered on my walls, you know, picture of Carl Sagan, you know, who was kind of my childhood hero, as geeky as that is. So those were big influences on me. Well, that's not geeky at all. In fact, when I first saw you, I thought to myself, that man reminds me of Carl Sagan, and that's why I came and talked to you. So there you go. And that's a compliment from us geek girls, let me tell you. So, Thank you. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who is interested in learning more about Cassini, Saturn, and the moons of Saturn? Well, the Internet, of course. Um, all you have to do is just Google Saturn and NASA. Just say Saturn, comma, NASA. And one of the first two or three sites you'll see, it'll say Cassini-Huygens mission to Saturn. And that'll take you to the JPL link, which is a really great place to, to go. And we've got new images up almost every day that come down from the spacecraft. And also another great site is from the Planetary Society. If you just Google Planetary Society, uh, you'll get to their website, and they've got write-ups on every single mission that's flying and a fantastic science blog. If you really want good science that is kind of written for the layman, but that's where I get most of my information. Great. Well, this was a fascinating talk, and thank you so much, John, for taking the time to talk with us. Oh, my pleasure.